My name is Rhett Milner. I am a high school student and a Boy Scout. This following documentary is my Eagle Scout project, The Veterans of Grand Island. The town of Grand Island in itself is unique. It isn't an island, and it isn't very grand either. It's the third largest city in Nebraska. It's too large to be intimate, and it's too small to be entertaining. Yet, the community, amongst other things, was very strong in its love for the veterans of the military. Grand Island is home to the Veterans Association Medical Center, the Home, Veterans Memorial Cemetery, and the United Veterans Club. The county's Veterans Service Office offers a multitude of services for disabled and retired veterans. The county hosts hero flights, taking veterans to the places where they served, and local Boy Scout troops serve the community by planting flags on each grave of the Memorial Cemetery during Memorial Day, and they go caroling in the Vets Hospital during Christmas time. Now, what an Eagle Project is supposed to do is to benefit the community. Typically, this means a construction project, a new park bench, or a swing set. So, this documentary is not your typical Eagle Project. However, one of the things I find most beneficial to myself is to be reminded by family and friends of who I am, what I do best, and who I help. That's how I plan to benefit my community through this documentary. To remind my community of what it is. To remind them of the veterans, why they went to war, what they experienced, and what many of them fought for. To remind them of their journey home, how they were received, and the torment many still experience. I interviewed a total of 18 veterans. Some I knew beforehand, most I did not. I interviewed members from the Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and especially the Army. Some fought in Korea, some in Vietnam, and some in the Middle East. However, all of them had a story to tell. All of them had memories worth sharing, lessons worth teaching, and all of them had trials worth understanding. As we listen and watch them, understanding truly is the least we can do to understand and to remember their sacrifices and stories. Because what is history if not a collection of stories? We are either the tellers or the listeners. I thank you for taking time out of your life and viewing this. And I ask of you to listen, understand, and most importantly to remember the veterans of Grand Island. Our first questions revolved around the early days of service for the veterans including their reasons of joining, the training they underwent, and how they adjusted to military life. First off, we asked them the reasons for joining the specific branches they were in, and also what they were doing before they entered the service. Drank. A lot. <laughs> I worked at, like, restaurants, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, so I, uh... Up until I was about 22, 18 to 22, I just kind of was stagnant, didn't know what I wanted to do, and so I figured, you know, I'll join the Army, get some life lessons, you know, maybe figure out a trade or something. Shortly before I graduated, there had been a bombing of a Marine barracks in Beirut in 83, and I guess that's what made me want to go into the Marine Corps, made me want to go into the service as well. Back in the day, when I was still a kid, I uh, had a friend that was went to the Marine Corps. I had another friend that went to the Army, but they were a little older than me. But I followed after the footsteps of the Marine. I wanted to enlist because I didn't want to be drafted. Because they put you wherever they want you when they draft you. You join the Air Force, you stay in the Air Force. But nobody shoots at you in the Air Force. <laughs> when I became an orphan, that's when I decided, you know, if someday I ever have a chance, I will be a military man. And I got that chance, and I did go. They did ask me if I was interested in Navy or what I preferred, and I think I said the Army would probably be best for me. I had five uncles that had also served in World War II, 
so they'd given me quite a bit of information on what went on in the service. I applied for the Air Force, thinking I probably wouldn't get it because my grades weren't that good. But uh, I surprised myself and they, they took me. So I went and volunteered to go to the Air Force and ended up doing something completely different in the military. I ended up as a dog handler. Next, we interviewed them on their experiences with the basic and specialized training they received. That's the first time I've ever been in snow in my life. I'm from California. And I got the basic training, and the first job they gave me was shoveling snow. And I looked at them like they were crazy. <laughs> well, it was unexpected to start with, but then I decided it's something i got to do. I'm going to do it and get it over with. They sent me off to Fort Lewis, Washington. I went through infantry training. After training infantry, I went to airborne training, jump out of airplanes. That was nice. And it was during the infantry training. It was during the bayonet training in, in infantry where I decided to go to flight school. The, the drill instructor would yell, what's the spirit of the bayonet? And everybody would yell to kill as we plunged our bayonet rifle into a dummy. And I said, that isn't for me. I didn't want to do that. So I, I decided to go to flight school. I had a choice of learning codes or photography. And in high school, my, my hobby had been photography, so I chose photography. Photography was perfect for me. That's what I chose, and they gave it to me. I happened to be a medic, so I stayed in my school for six months in San Antonio, Texas. I learned the different parts of the body, uh, how to treat patients, and what to do in case of an emergency on any part of the body. Next, we interviewed them on their experiences with their training instructors. If you're not how, taught how to, how to work together like that, you're kind of screwed, and, and, and you get all that from your drill instructors, how to work together, how to, how to be more than just an individual, how to look at it as, you know, working at, as a team. The drill, you get all that from your drill instructors. They're the, they're the best teachers you can ever have. They just, uh, I mean, anytime you wanted to address them or anything, you had to say, Drill Sergeant Roster number 227, private career, requesting permission to speak, Drill Sergeant. I mean, everything you said, you had to yell. And, like, they, they didn't, like, make friends with anybody. I mean, it was just, like, pure business with them or, or like, I don't know. I mean, they weren't, like, they weren't very friendly. <laughs> well, we had a training instructor. We had one. He was called the Bulldog. They like to wake you up 5.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, excuse me. Get in, your three S's, use the restroom, you shower, you shave, come back, make up your bed, be down to breakfast by 6 a.m. And finally, we interviewed them on how they adjusted to military life. It's a, a whole new concept. Uh, uh, you get the boot camp, no radios, no TV, no newspaper. You're cut off from the world, basically. Uh, uh, and you're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And a lot of us weren't used to that, so we had to kind of conform to their, either conform they could chat one or two, so you had to conform. It's kind of hard when you first go in. You know, you're used to your civilian life and doing pretty much what you want to do most of the time. But uh, when you go in the military, of course, you have to learn to take orders. I mean, uh, you get all kinds of orders. And uh, from uh, how you dress, your military uniform, to uh, learning, you know, to salute. Uh, it was difficult at first, you know, I mean, because you're used to doing whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and then you don't have a choice in any matter anymore, you know, you, you go where they tell you to go, you eat when they tell you to eat, you poop when they tell you to poop, you know, 
That's that's the way the military is. You have no freedom. You just give it all up so that everybody else back here can enjoy their freedom. No, it's a change of life. When you go to the training camp, you're regimented. When to go to bed, when to get up, when to eat, when to sit and relax. You're told when and how to do everything. Discipline is what you learn. It's The military is discipline, discipline, discipline. And I guess that's one of the hardest things to get used to. Next, we interview the veterans about the positions and duties they performed while in the service. When I first got to Korea, we, we uh, was assigned to pick and shovel at working on roads because I was an engineer. My duties were normally from the air and from the ground. From the ground was to take combat pictures plus pictures of enemy installations for the artillery. From the air was strictly for infantry and for artillery, so they knew what they were up against. So I would drive up to be there all prepared to get involved in the fighting. Usually I was there in time to take some pictures and haul out some wounded guys, which I did fairly often at all those hills. And wherever something was going on is where I was sent which was logical when you're a photographer. I enjoyed my job. I loaded and unloaded airplanes. I shipped stuff all over the U.S. I had great duty. You know, it was, it, we were in combat all the time. I, I, loved, I loved the duty because as a helicopter pilot, I got to fly every mission that the 101st Airborne had. And that was a wide variety of missions. We would support the 3rd Brigade, that was the 3rd Infantry Brigade, combat assaults and resupplies. That's all we did, combat assaults and resupplies. And it was non-stop. When we would do combat assaults, they might be on, let's say it's on a ridge, they would blow an LZ just big enough for the helicopter to land in. And that's what we did. You, could, you would fly in this ridge, drop troops off, and Basically, you would just hover over the edge and just dive down the valley and take off. It was a unique, unique environment. Okay, in Vietnam, I was just a regular mechanic on a, uh, a maintenance crew. And uh, on the Chinook helicopters, for every hundred hours that they fly, well, then they would bring them in for a periodic inspection, it was called. And a, a tech inspector, which was normally like an E6 or an E7 who had spent at minimum of uh, five years in the service, they would go out and they would fine tune, fine comb, tooth comb the aircraft, finding anything and everything that they could find wrong with that aircraft. They'd write all these things down. So then we would go through and repair all these different gigs on the sheet. You know, you, you were trying to eliminate any possible faults that could happen and cause the aircraft to go down. Uh, I worked in the engine room on an ammunition ship, and uh, <laughs> that was uh, quite a wrestling match because we had a sign that going down in the engine room that said, we don't consider this place hell, we consider hell a much cooler place. You know, I, I worked, I started out as a mechanic because the, 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 the Army looked at me and said, well, I was a basically a mechanic in the Navy. I wasn't. I was. I worked in the engine room board a ship. But the, the Army looked at it and said, it looks like I was a mechanic in the, in the Navy, so I should be a mechanic in the Army. So I started out as being a mechanic in the, in the Army, and then I stayed that way for 27 years. After being in airborne training, I was supposed to get sent to Vietnam to be airborne. When I got to Vietnam, I went to the airborne unit and they said, you're going to ride on a track. So I got to ride in a mechanized unit for a year. We done different things. You know, we still was out in the field for a whole year. And I got along with it. I was a, uh, in what they call aviation safety. And I handled all the paperwork for aircraft accidents. I'd have to go out with a camera and take pictures of the accident scene. I was also a left door gunner in CH-46 helicopters when I was in Vietnam. 
I would man the left door on right and back of the pilot. I was awarded eight air medals, so that showed you how much flying time I had. I had a lot of flying time. Because you have to receive fire for 20 times just to receive one air medal, so that shows you how much flying I did. I did a lot. Well, my duties on, on the submarine was uh, to make sure we didn't run into anything. Uh, uh, sonar is that uh, you, you're in the water and you detect underground uh, uh, mountain or something like that. You tell the captain where it's at, how big it is, and how to get around it. We took care of the barracks in uh, this military motel. It's where the weekend warriors stayed when they come up to Tyson and the airplanes don't fly up there. The pilots, stuff they stay there. And, and then we took care of the barracks, like painting them and, and uh, the furniture and laundry and stuff. First four years, I was in 14 years. The first four years, I was a medic. Worked in a hospital. Then worked down in the emergency room. The next 10 years, I was called disaster preparedness technician. We responded to airplane crashes. We responded to nuclear weapon accidents. And that was with, with the CVs, which is the uh, engineering arm of the Navy. So did a little bit of building, and the only time I ever got to build, I joined it to build. I joined the CVs to build stuff, but the only time I really got to do a lot of building was on the especially my last deployment there. We put up about 30 buildings in about, in less than 30 days. It was quite a, you know, I mean, <laughs> you couldn't sell them. No, no self-respecting realtor would try to sell them, but it was pretty much just plywood and, and, uh, and wooden joists. I made this uh, brigade sergeant manager laugh, and he decided to put me on his personal security detachment. It's called a PSD team. So I went with a bunch of infantry guys. Basically what they do is what like the Secret Service would do for the president. That's what we did for this brigade commander and brigade sergeant major. So whenever they went somewhere, we pulled security for them, you know, checked vehicles, checked people, and just made sure that they were safe. If bullets started flying or bombs started blowing up, then, we, you know, we'd grab them and take them and, you know, take off. I was a 240 Bravo machine gunner. Like, as soon as we'd go on mission for... 12 hours, sometimes 24 at a time. And, uh, I was in a striker. Uh, it's like a uh, tank with six w uh, wheels on it, and or tires, I guess. And I was the only other guy outside the hatch, so I mean, I was always the one pulling guard with one machine gun when we would roll out for missions and stuff. The veterans next shared stories of friendships they made while in the service. You will never have a stronger, better friendship, I think than you will in the, in the military because you are, like they say, a band of brothers. Your job is there to make sure that you're, the guy to the left and right is coming home safe, you know, coming home alive and you care about them and their family. Whereas here in civilian life, it's all, how am I gonna, how am I gonna be better than this person? It's competition in life, you know, whereas there, all you cared about is you getting home safe and them getting home safe. And that's all that it mattered and nothing else did. If you don't have any brothers, you will find you have brothers in, in the military. And you'll miss it when you get out because there's nothing like a brotherhood in your whole lifetime that you'll ever have. Life and death in combat, that's what friendship is like. You risk your life for your friend, and vice versa. No questions asked. Friendships are very important when you're in the military. Uh, well, you can't help but make friends because you're around them every day, like a, a brother or sister. So they're very important. You have to learn to be around people and to trust people. And the most important part, you had to learn to depend on other people. Because a lot of situations you were in, when you went overseas, you found out you couldn't be by yourself a lot of times. You had to have friends around you. I'll tell you about one LZ we went into. It was called LZ Kelly. It was a 10-ship combat assault. The lead aircraft would go in, land, 
and it, just as he was pulling pitch and ready to take off, the next aircraft would be on the way in, flaring out and just touching down just after he left. We went up this long valley, hung a left, and that was the approach to the LZ. And everything went smooth, but everybody got shot at a lot. When I turned file for the LZ, I had a straight shot. There was one guy in the LZ, the aircraft to hit me, I had his in sight. And the whole hillside, what it looked like was little sparklers in trees all along the hillside, little sparklers. Everywhere you look, there's sparklers. And I realized those are muzzle flashes all shooting at me. We were vir flying through a virtual wall of bolts. As I was coming in, I had a Cobra flying. All of a sudden, he showed up right alongside me, very close, very close. He passed me, and he started a little bit in front of me, like this. And I keyed the mic and asked him, what the hell are you doing? And he radioed back my job. I'm out of ammo. He was flying in front of me, trying to protect me from the bolts. That's the caliber of men I flew with. And every man was like that. They were top-notch people. They'd give their lives in a heartbeat for anybody else. They also shared some lighthearted and humorous experiences. Well, we had movies at night, and uh, you've watched MASH, you know how they're always showing the, the uh, film breaking and Klinger getting yelled at. Well, that's the way it really was. The film was always breaking. And, the films were very, very old, and the, but uh, you sat out underneath the stars on an old rotor blade and watched the movie. And, uh, if you had a can of beer, you scraped the rust off the top of the can first, opened it up with a church key. And, uh, you know, the beer had been heated and cooled and heated and cooled and pretty old by the time you got to you, but it was better than nothing. I know one guy was on R&R. &R. Back to Japan, he brought a quart of whiskey back, and I got drunk on Christmas back at 52. <laughs> I didn't get drunk, but I got pretty happy, I'll tell you. We used to pass out candy to the kids all the time, and uh, I, I got a picture of this little redheaded boy. It was just kind of weird, because, like, yeah, he, he had, like, my skin tone, and he had red hair, and... Uh, it was wild, man. I, I gave him a whole bunch of candy. I was like, yeah, give that kid a bunch, man. You know, he's got red hair. <laughs> was, I don't know, just, he looked like a little me, and it was weird to see him in Iraq. You know, we used to do stupid stuff. Like, I remember <laughs> we'd make the kids get in fights. Like, I'd like, be like, if you want some of this candy, you got to punch them in the face. <laughs> and they would just <laughs> knock each other out, like, boom. And uh, give them some candy. And... So we had a vent fan. And it had, it had burned out and it was to the birthing space below so we could get really hot there. And it was in the shop for probably two and a half weeks getting rewound. So I had, I was in charge of getting this motor to assemble and it was in a vertical duct so it's up and down and it was supposed to blow the air down into the compartment. So I looked it up and did a test run and it, it was running backwards blowing the air the wrong way. So I changed the wires and checked it out. And everything was fine. Well, I got down to the shop and I said, Jim, I said, I don't know what happened. I did everything right. I hooked it up and I pushed the button and the fan blew up. And he goes, oh, no. And I says, well, then I turned two wires around and it blows down now like it's supposed to. <laughs> he was just about ready to do it. Yeah. That was, I guess that was my funny electrician story, but it was, at the time, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. One other time I was riding on the track, and we ran over a mine. And the mine blew the track up in the air, and I was sitting on some food ration boxes, and all the people behind me said, Tony, that's all we could see is a cloud of dust, and you flying through the air sitting on boxes. I remember running gun drills in Okinawa, in the jungle, and tripping in the mud, and getting hit in the mouth with the mortar tube as I was trying to put the base plate down. 
because it was it was more than raining. We were actually in a storm. They could not medevac me, so they sent <laughs> they sent a jeep for me, and the jeep got lost in the jungle. And then once they picked me up, we got lost going back. <laughs> After this, the veterans shared the darker side to their time in the service. We asked them about moments that changed their lives and what it's like to be in combat. They shared what they witnessed, what they did, and how it affected them for the rest of their lives. Basically did everything that you learned to do, but you know it was for real. And that you could possibly get killed. That was the common denominator in it. So it was frightening, to say the least. Everything changes in your life when you when you kill somebody or somebody, uh, you see somebody get killed. That, that changes uh, your life considerably. We uh, would go out and uh, pick up injured. We'd also pick up Vietnamese injured. It seemed as though they injured as many of their own people as they did Americans because they would be walking to work, they would trip a landmine and both men and women would be injured. That was part of our mission to go in and, and take civilians to their civilian hospital in Da Nang. And I remember that probably more than anything. I remember every time I would do that, I would always give a prayer, of course for my own self, but then for them too. And we was going out to cut trees and we don't know, it was right after Heartbreak Ridge, and it was, the battle was still going on, and I don't know whether it was a mortar round or whether it was a mine, but anyway, it blew the whole front end off the truck, and that's why I got my leg hurt. We, there was a restaurant that somebody walked into with a suicide vest on and blew themselves up. And so the colonel wanted to go up there and talk with the people and stuff, and we ended up going to this hospital. And I'm seeing, you know, children six, seven years old with limbs blown off and half their face missing and, you know, just screaming. I, I'll never forget the wailing of the children that were, yeah, that was, that was bad. And those are the ones that really stick with you. I made my first kill of I actually shot him in the in the knee. That was the only th only shot that hit him. But you can see the lines going up his leg to his heart, and that was a shot from the bullet. He was dead with about five or six other VC in the air. On this battle, we had troops coming down from the hill, wounded, you know, and this Gary Litter, a lieutenant, or. And he got shot in the neck, and he was bleeding pretty bad. We was bringing him down the hill, and uh, we got him to the first aid tent. We was going back up there, they, online, and this uh, Chinaman, he'd come out of the hill, out of the trees. His leg was all shot to pieces, and I thought, oh boy. I uh, struck my rifle and told him to halt. And he put up his hands and, and I, he had a stick, he was cr crunching along and I took him down to the, to the uh, headquarters and uh, really shocked me. I'll never forget that incident. What happened to him, I don't know, but I thought, boy, I, he could have shot me. I wouldn't even know that he got shot. He stuck out of the trees just like that. But he was wounded pretty bad, boy. His leg was all tore up. We were hit by an EFP pretty good. And like everyone in the, I was the only one in the vehicle actually that didn't get hit by any shrapnel. And my buddy's like whole shoulder got knocked, you know, totally taken off. And uh, but I got a really bad TBI. I was like knocked out for. I don't. I don't. Nobody knows exactly how long, but I like pretty much missed like a lot of the firefight because. Uh, I hit, like, I went down to take cover for a minute, and then when we got blasted, like, my head hit, got hit on the hatch. Somehow I hit, like, I was trying to come outside of the hatch, and my, I hit my head, and uh, was just knocked out for a long time. I couldn't speak right for a while after. It was a traumatic brain injury, is what a TBI is. And, uh, 
Still, my memory is not right. I got hit by two hand grenades that the Chinese threw at me, but I responded. I was able to fire back. I got a couple of them. We put people in on a fire base in the mountains called, and they called it Ripcord. It was constantly being attacked. The 101st Division finally decided it just wasn't worth it anymore. They were going to evacuate the fire base. Picture this if you can. There were six helicopter companies. Each had ten aircraft, all making donuts, circles in the air. The only little flights, six flights of ten, orbiting in the flatlands, all waiting to go into the fire base to start the evacuation. The barrage of artillery on that fire base was unbelievable. All the enemy mortars coming in, unbelievable. But the enemy had, what they had done, they had concentrated all their mortar tubes on one pad at a time. So they would hit, I think we had three pads. They would hit one pad, they would move to pad number two, and then they would move to pad number three. They would monitor which pad was being hit and they would, head, they would head for that pad, thinking that it would move to the next pad, which they did. And he was, then he would tell them which pad to land on. And that's what they did. That's how they got along with the evacuation. Unfortunately, when I came in, it was all clear, and I had just flared out, get ready to set up, and another, another mortar hit. And knocked all the guys I was going to pick up down flat, completely flattened them all. And so I, I touched on that. One of the guys, one of the crewmen, he and Mike said, go around, go around. I said, no, we got to get these guys. You know, they're wounded bad, we, we, we got to pick them up. So my crew chief and gunner jumped out of my aircraft, ran over, and they picked all six of those guys up, one at a time. That took forever. And my three seconds went out the window a long time ago. And we always said, we, on, and on the ground longer than three seconds, you're dead. But they got all the guys on board. We took off, I took them back to Charlie Med for, uh, for uh, medic medical attention. Boy, they were hit bad. Blood has a, a distinct odor. And once you smelled it, it stays with you a long time. But you can smell blood, that's how thick it was. When we got back to the, our company compound, they had to wash the floor of the Huey because it was just nothing but red. Next, the veterans talked about their homecomings, how they got home, and how they were received by their community. Red Cross pulled me out and brought me home. I flew home on the Tiger. We landed in Guam. Then we landed in Hawaii. Then we landed in Travis Airfield, California. And I never was so happy to see the United States Again, just filled my heart full of love, I guess, to see the mainland. I didn't have much money. Matter of fact, I think I went to Red Cross and got turned down. And then I went to Salvation Army. And I, they gave me a bus ticket to go up to Grand Isle. That's how I got home. You know, you didn't get much reception when you came home. Your family, of course, was glad to see you home, that you'd made it through that at and, you know, experience. That was about it. Nobody really cared. They didn't even, I don't think a lot of people even knew I was the I left. We did have some trouble at airports uh, with people that didn't think uh, we were very nice, and we just avoided them. Uh, when I was in Oakland waiting for my plane there, I was spit at. I was called a baby killer. Uh, not a very friendly relation, or you know, reception. They didn't treat us very. They, in fact, they even went so far as to tell us to take off our uniforms and get out of uniform before we left Treasure Island because they, they, they people, the people didn't like the soldiers. Uh, they were coming home from, so you know, they didn't like the war. They just didn't like the war. So when I got out of the army, I got treated pretty well. But when I came home from the navy. I didn't get treated very well at all. I don't know, I had pretty bad PTSD when I first got back, so it was like, I was a whole different person kind of for a while, and, and, I, and I, I was struggling with uh, addiction pretty bad, so um, 
I don't know, they kind of received me as like, what's happened to them, you know, like, but, I don't know, I'm sure they were proud of me in some ways, but they were also kind of felt like they lost their son, because that was like a different person. However, the soldier's struggle does not end with his tour of duty. What a veteran brings home is the true battle. I got, a friend of mine got stuck in the sand, and he pulled me out with a big truck. And he went this way, and then he turned this way fast. And he flipped the forklift that I was on over, and he caught me underneath and broke my back. I was such an athlete, they would not understand that I was in this chair forever. The only reason I actually came home was so I could get a divorce from my wife. She left me while I was in Japan. She wasn't happy with the fact that I told her when she miscarried that I couldn't come home. I was on what they call ACB at the time, Air Contingency Battalion, which is basically if any major stuff happens, we're the first to respond. Because of being on that, they would not let me come home. And she got all mad and she left. It was really hard to adjust back to civilian life. When I got out of the Army then, uh, in fact, I actually ended up back in, in the hospital a few times because I, I, I just couldn't adjust to civilian life. I did, I did eventually, but it, it was tough. It was, getting back to civilian life was not easy. Um, you know, there's good memories and there's bad, you know. I, you try to focus on the good, but a lot of times the bad comes up in dreams or whatnot, and it's hard to shake. But you know, we had a lot of fun times and in, in over there joking around with the guys and stuff. But it seems like the bad ones are—they're the ones that really scar you and uh, and uh, stick with you more because you're not used to seeing stuff like that. You know, it's been hard. That's why I'm here right now. It's I haven't been able to adjust very well. I try to block out a lot of the memories and stuff with uh, drugs and alcohol, actually. <laughs> so it's not the way to go, that's for sure. It's about the worst. The addiction's actually been harder than anything I went through in the military, so. I've been to a lot of rehabs and detoxes and psych wards and, uh, and just struggled with addiction, pretty much. I mean, it's been bad. Uh, I guess, like, I mean, I've worked here and there, you know, for a while, but uh, my PTSD just kind of, like, sometimes, like, uh, things will set me off when I get angry real quick and, you know, say something to my boss or something, lose a job, or, or I get angry and I abuse or drink, so pretty much it hasn't been fun since I got out. <laughs> PTSD that, you know, it's hard to get over, whereas when I first come back, I remember it was like um, end of June, and so July was coming up, fireworks went off, I'd hear a bang, or car backfire, and I'd hit the ground, you know, and be on my stomach looking for my weapon, you know, and it was crazy, but, you know, eventually it starts to wear off a little bit more and more, and, but it's... It's something that you're gonna you're gonna take with you the rest of your life is that 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 PTSD you you will bear that for the rest of your life for sure. But I guess one way it has affected me is that when I hear like you know how when the noise that a that a deep freeze makes when you shut the door you know the the ones that when the lid falls down it makes that whoop sound. That's the sound of a mortar about a half a mile away. <laughs> So when it's every once in a while, like even the door at work will sometimes, it'll slam shut, the wind hits it right, it's like, yeah. I have problems with PTSD. You never forget some things. Different sounds will trigger different feelings, and you, I've learned to live with them, not make them such a, an issue sometimes. Sometimes it won't <clears throat> cause different effects in your, in your life, but you'll, You'll get a work. You know, I was thinking maybe of the hard times and having bad dreams. You just can't really get along with them. 
So as the years go by, I've, it got a lot better. It was rough. It's uh, taken a long time, but I've been doing a lot better now. Now that I got a, a decent fiance that, that I get along with, and we really talk a lot of things through. She understands me. I understand her. I know I won't give her up for nothing. It was good. It was very good. After military life, there's no ifs, ands, or buts in civilian life. You do almost anything you please. So it was great compared to the Army. Nobody's shooting at you either. You can go to bed when you want, get up when you want, eat when you are hungry, all kinds of good things in civilian life. You don't know how good you got it. And finally, the veterans closed their interviews with finishing thoughts that they had about their service, the military, and war in general. The military is, is necessary. It's not always easy. And it's not always done well. But I think the people that do go to war, that actually do the fighting and the dying, mean well. When it comes right down to it, it's not so much God and country as it is. They're helping. They're protecting the people on either side of them. It's just they're, they're, it is a band of brothers in a world of war. And if people join the military to go to war, <clears throat> they probably shouldn't be in it. There's nothing wrong with the military. The military is a good thing if it's used properly and you can adjust to it. That's, that's a big thing for young people. They've got to learn how to adjust to military life. I see nothing wrong. In fact, I think it's a great thing for kids to your, your age to get in the military for a year, uh, go in the reserves and get out if you want to. You, you, you find out if you like it or not. And if you like it, stay in. I advise everybody to go in the service. It is a good part of life that you miss if you don't go in. And it's not so much learning discipline. It's learning friendships. It's learning how to live and deal with other people. And a lot of places that you are stationed at, you just live, learn to enjoy. Like a lot of places I've been. Italy, Germany, Turkey, Greece. I'll never get there, but I've been there. Don't make any major mistakes, because if you do, it will follow you your entire life. Sometimes you got to make sacrifices, you know. Uh, you got to do things that you normally want to do, you know, to make sure you got your buddies back, you know. I'm starting to realize, I mean, I did what I had to do, you know. If people got hit in the line of fire, it was just that it was, uh, there was people behind the people that I hit. This world is so full of different people and different ways of doing things. Uh, you just have to kind of uh, be open to uh, the differences in people. Since I've been in the service, I see everybody as a, as a human being. There's no color in my in my book. Nobody has a color. Everybody's a human being in my in my book because it's not correct for anybody to judge anybody in that opinion. War's horrible. It's absolutely the worst thing ever. Oftentimes it's necessary. It's not anything I ever want to do again, that's for sure. Well, it's made me like, I don't even want to kill a bunny rabbit anymore, or like any kind of animal or nothing. Like, I'm just like against killing now because I don't, I don't like the feeling of uh, killing anybody. Like, to me, it's like not, it wasn't cool. Like some of the guys thought it was cool, like how many kills, see how many kills they could get or whatever. But to me, it was the feeling of just like, you didn't know if it was good or bad or what it was. It was just a weird feeling you can't really explain. I don't like killing. I think it's stupid. War should be done by word of mouth. Talk it over. You can always two sides to every story. And the war never solved anything that I ever see. Vietnam is the same situation. And it never will solve anything. People should live in harmony. And now the veterans leave us with final words about the VA and how grateful we should be to be living in America. And this hospital is great for that. Incorporating all the veterans into somehow to make you feel at home and 
wanted and they do a good job here, I think. If I didn't have the VA, I probably I might be dead right now. I don't know how what I would do. But, you know, I had a stroke in August and you know, without this I would have I wouldn't be going home Tuesday. We live in a great country here and uh, it's it's uh I think taken for granted by too many people. They think that uh, you know, the economy is so bad and this and that, but I mean if you go to a different country for a while, I mean you'll realize that we have it pretty darn good over here, so quit complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate the country you got, because it is by far the greatest country in the world, and yeah, keep it that way. Thank you for viewing this. It means the world to me and every single veteran you have heard today. Some of them were heroes, some were saviors, and some are simply storytellers. Some have suffered, and some continue to suffer today. I ask for your prayers or whatever you see fit, for the men who still struggle with their duty, though it is finished. The veterans have finished telling their stories. Whether these stories are 10, 20, 40, or even 60 years old, they have shared them now. Whether these stories were shared with friends, family, or were held in secrecy, they have been shared with you. Their time in this Eagle Project has come to an end. Now the camera turns to you. Their story is now yours as well. So what will you do now? I assume if you're watching this, you know a veteran personally. Some of you might actually be one. So after this, how will you view them or treat them? You may need to change some things, everything, or hopefully nothing. How will you view military service? How will you view war? These are only questions. I don't actually expect you to walk away from this documentary different, with different views or different beliefs. I only ask one thing, the same thing I asked at the beginning, for you to remember. Remember this documentary, remember the veterans you've heard, remember their stories, remember.